This week on Motor Week, Richard Hammond pits Toyota's new Celica against an old favorite of ours, the Peugeot 406 Coupe. Ginny Buckley tries the sporty Seat Leon. And Chris Goffey enjoys the Plymouth Prowler. The coupe market is flourishing. There's probably never been a wider choice of shapes and styles for buyers to choose from, which makes the pressure on manufacturers all the greater when it comes time to introduce a new model into an increasingly fashion-conscious marketplace. So we've chosen two of the most contrasting coupes available today to take a look at. We have a timeless classic in the elegant and understated shape of the Peugeot 406 Coupe. And contrasting very much with that, we have, well, a rather loud new arrival in the shape of the new Toyota Celica. Like so many before them, Peugeot went to styling legend and hero of the drawing board, Pininfarina, for the shape of their new car. The result is beautiful, a blend of curves with details you will keep discovering as you live with the car. One look is enough to know that this shape is certain to become a future classic. Inside though, I'm less impressed. The dashboard from the 406 saloon may have been glammed up with a few chrome instrument bezels and an admittedly tasty chrome gear lever, but it's not enough. I was disappointed with the interior of this car when I first saw it at launch and I've been consistently disappointed every time I've climbed into one since. At first glance, it seems the Celica can't make up its mind whether to be rounded or sharp-edged. Overall, it is a, well, it's a fairly curvaceous shape, but it's made up of all these starkly cut-in straight lines. And at the front, well, it does make quite a bold statement and it certainly gets some attention. At the rear, though, I think it's ugly. And that attention-grabbing exterior is complemented by an equally striking interior. There's no doubt there's a lot of thought gone into this. Some of it not as successful as others. Looking at the dash itself, it's a bit like sitting here with Darth Vader staring straight back at you. And if you want to frighten the kids in the back, <laughs> just do that. It isn't unattractive at all. The only problem is terrible quality plastics tap it anywhere and it feels very cheap and tacky. These racing seats are very comfortable and they look great but perhaps rather thin for a longer journey. But the best thing of all about the interior is the driving position. Almost on the floor with your legs straight out in front of you, you feel like you really are about to take off in something a little bit sporty. And on first pulling away, that impression of sportiness is borne through. That low slung driving position makes you feel a bit special. But the next thing you notice is the steering. It's very, very light, which is fine, but it's pretty numb. It doesn't seem to tell you much of what's going on. That can't be said about the gearbox, though. It's great, very, very slick action. Six gears as well, which is very handy when you get to motorways. But the next thing you'll notice on motorways is the noise. It's enormous. It does sound as though somebody forgot to put any sound deadening in the rear wheel arches, and you've got this constant thrum and hum from behind your ears, which gets very wearing on a longer journey. The ride's very good though, it's fairly harsh, don't expect to be as comfortable as in an ordinary saloon car, but then you are in a coupe. It gets a bit crashing over bumps and it, perhaps it's a bit much through town, but as soon as you start to press on on a country road, you do appreciate that lack of body roll and the control you feel you've got over the car. Now in a real sports car, boot space is about as relevant as sleeve length on a tank top. But a coupe is different. It has to be able to demonstrate some real practical tourability. So what have we got in the case of the Celica? It's not too bad. It's quite shallow, but it is fairly square and sensibly shaped. All fairly useful and practical. But what about the Peugeot? It's huge. I know it's corny but you really could hide a body in there. Come on, out.
If the Peugeot looks a bit of a smoothie, it drives very much the same way. The ride handling compromise is nigh on perfect, as is the weighting of the steering. It's pretty light, but communicative. You know what's going on. The gear change may be a bit long in the arm, but once you've got used to it, it is slick. It's definitely the best of the coupes if you wish to have your driving ability flattered and the easiest to hustle down your favourite cross-country roads. It's also the most serene place to be. This interior may well boast all the stylistic passion of a full Mica worktop, but it's very, very good at making you comfortable over a long journey, turning the 406 coupe into very much a long-legged cruiser. This particular one has the 3.0-litre V6 engine. It's perhaps fairer to compare the 2.0-litre version on price anyway with the Toyota Celica. And in fact, there are those that say they prefer the 2.0-litre and that the loss of the smoothness of the V6 is more than compensated for by the loss of weight up front and the subsequent improvement to the handling. Look, if we're going to be realistic, then makes no difference whatsoever which of these two I decide I like the best because any car in the coupe class is going to be bought primarily by looks and looks alone and that's entirely a personal thing. I will tell you that for me the sight of the Celica at first made me shudder in my boots. I did not like it. Now though, well I've changed my mind and I do like it and that's something I would probably whisper in the pub. But if I were to be buying one of these two then it would probably have to be the better all-rounder, the elegantly styled Peugeot 406 Coupe. For you though, it could be either of them. It could be neither of them. There's no shortage of choice at the moment. You could go for a Fiat Coupe instead or a Ford Cougar. What about a BMW 3 Series Coupe or a, a Volvo C70? Oh, a Mercedes CLK. When some cars arrive in our office, they provoke a mad scramble from the young people who work there in an attempt to get their hands on the keys. And getting those keys back is the equivalent of prizing Paul Merson out of the bar at closing time. But when the news gets out that the latest is a Seat called Leon, you can bet it won't even raise a murmur. You know, I think the name might have something to do with it. I mean, Leon, what's all that about then? You wouldn't dream of calling a car Harry or Fred now, would you? Volkswagen tried it with the Chiran and that didn't work either. I don't know what this name thing is all about, but they've got to do better than that. The Leon is a cross between a hatchback and a coupe, and although there aren't any real distinctive modern lines suggesting anything new or different for Seat, it does have a rather nice muscular rear end. A hint of the sportiness this car offers can be seen in the rear spoiler and the way the number plate is moulded into the bumper. The Leon 4 is unusual because it's the fastest car in its class in production. It produces a whopping 180 brake horsepower, has a six-speed gearbox and a four-wheel drive system. What? Those three? On this little thing? That's got your attention, hasn't it? The Leon comes with a wide range of engines. In total, there are seven options. Three direct injection diesels, four petrol versions, and there's even an automatic. There are a ridiculously wide range of options available from Seat, including, of course, the engine versions. There are three finishes. Stella, which is the well-equipped base model. Signa, which has even more electric gadgets and an onboard computer, air conditioning and an upgraded stereo. And Sport, which has the lowered chassis, more electronics, big fat alloy wheels and sport seats. Inside, you'll see that Seat have decided understatement is definitely the name of the game. And a Leon may promise to be a rather thrilling drive, but the sportiest thing you'll find in here, I've got to say, is the seats. The rest of it is a bit dull and a bit bland. But having said that, everything is very well laid out and the quality is absolutely superb. You can really see just how far Seat have come since they've been part of the good old Volkswagen group. And believe me, it really does feel very quick indeed. It's absolutely great fun to drive. The engine is very responsive and it simply begs you to put your foot down. But when you do that, there is an awful lot of power going through those wheels. 
Now the key is the Haldex rear wheel system, which electronically measures the amount of torque distributed to the rear wheels and then connects both axles depending on the driving conditions, which, now wait for it, are measured electronically by engine sensors, wheel sensors and bodywork sensors. Now you can expect to see the Seat Leon at your local dealers in the spring. The entry level model will cost just under 13 grand, while this one, the Leon 4, will set you back £17,995. There are a combination of 14 colours and three interior finishes available, and other options are just what you'd expect from any major manufacturer. Seat seem to produce two different types of cars. Practical, well-made runarounds that are excellent value for money, or fun-packed, sporty little numbers that get their genes from Seat's rally cars. So which one of those two groups does the Leon 4 fit into? Well, it's a bit of an oddity really. It manages to combine all of those characteristics, which is a very good thing. I just know which side of it I prefer. In part two of Motor Week, the wild Plymouth Prowler and Vauxhall's revamped Omega. I learned something the other day. I always thought hot rods were something that American teenagers built out of old Ford V8s. Not true. The term comes from the 1920s in Britain when a Rolls-Royce engineer was asked to develop a racing engine for an air race and he got 1,500 horsepower out of a, an engine that had previously only developed 800. His name, Rodwell Banks, hence Hot Rod. This is a name that's much more familiar, Plymouth. And this is the Prowler. It's the only Hot Rod made by a mass manufacturer. When I say mass manufacturer, they're going to make 3,000 of these things, and Pl Plymouth say there's currently 30,000 on the waiting list. So, why do so many people want a car like this? The answer, it's dramatic good looks. I mean, it really stunned the motoring press when it was first shown at the 1996 International Motor Show. Since then, only three have come into the country. This is one of them. And there's going to be no more either because SVA, Special Vehicle Approval, simply will not cope with the way the lights, the bumpers and the front wings are organised on this car. And Chrysler, who make Plymouth, say they're not prepared to compromise and change the car just for British law. So this is as many as you're going to get. The concept is simple. You take the classic lines of the old American hot rod, an aluminium chassis, aluminium independent suspension front and back, a 3.5 litre V6 engine chucking out something over 220 brake horsepower, four-speed automatic transmission, and there it is. The essence of the old hot rods was their simplicity. And despite its dramatic looks, the Prowler hasn't really changed any of that. So I remember seeing this at the, the 1996 show. I mean, how, how come you've got one here? Well, I saw it at the 96 show as well. It was hanging up, if you remember, on some sort of racking. Um, fell in love with it there. And there's a friend of mine who deals in performance cars in Canada. I happened to be talking just a while ago and said, if you see a Prowler, can you get one for me? Expecting a two-year wait. Mm. And a week later, he came back and said he had one for me. Is it a rude question to ask you what you paid for it? Yeah, just a little. <laughs> <laughs> a slight premium. <laughs> yeah, just a slight a, premium. A big premium, a big premium. Um, and uh, any trouble getting it uh, to, to be legal on British roads? Um, nothing major. We spent about a thousand pounds on it, on having the lighting altered and changed around, but nothing major, nothing major. So David, the only one in the country, what's it insured for? It's insured for 80,000 pounds. And you're prepared to let us drive it? 
Yeah, sure. And it does go, as you imagine, an old hot rod Ford really would. It's quite funny looking into the eyes of drivers coming the other way as well, because they perceptively widen as you come round the corner. Chrysler claim that this has European standards of steering, road holding and handling. Not quite sure where they get those European standards from. It's very light aluminium chassis, aluminium suspension, and a composite body shell means the whole thing is very light. So, even though it's a V6, it's an off go. This automatic transmission is interesting. It uh, converts to a sort of slap shift, and you can go up and down through the gears, just bashing it either way. A bit frightening on the move because with the left-hand drive here, you simply cannot see that offside front wheel and the car's wider than you think. Now, if you did come to the top of the waiting list in the States, you could drive away in your Plymouth Prowler for around 25, 26,000 pounds. If you wanted to buy this, which is the only one in the country, it's 80,000 pounds. I know exclusivity comes expensive, but that's very expensive. Would I like one? Well, I have to say that uh, a wet Monday in Essex doesn't really compare to a sunny day down the King's Road. But even so, can't resist one more drive. Vauxhall and General Motors have probably never had it so good because in the past five years their flagship Amiga has been consistently at the top of the executive car charts. In that time they've beaten off the likes of the Ford Scorpio and the Rover 800. They've literally beaten those two cars into submission. The quirky frog-eyed Scorpio we never really took to and the Rover 800 after all was just a rover. So Vauxhall have taken the decision to freshen the Amiga range up, give it a new lease of life for the next three to four years before their next generation executive saloons and estates arrive. It's a very welcome upgrade to a car that's such a familiar sight on our roads. In fact, since its introduction in 1994, some 600,000 Amigas have been built at the plant in Germany. Indeed, Britain and Germany are the main markets for the Amiga. Three out of four buyers choose the saloon over the estate. And Vauxhall say that their designers and engineers have changed over a third of the car's 8,000 components. The most obvious are its exterior looks with a new bonnet and boot, new front and rear lights, colour keyed bumpers and sills and new ranges of alloy wheels, plus a new 2.2 litre four cylinder engine that now makes, if my sums are right, five engines to choose from. The entry level 2 litre 16 valve, the new to the range 2.2, the 2.5 V6, the 2.5 turbo diesel and the 3 litre V6, all available in manual or auto and in saloon or estate. Now, moving inside, again, it's an all-new interior. Vauxhall have tried to create, well, a touch of luxury, and I think they've pretty much succeeded. The dashboard has a soft-touch feel to it. There's a new centre console with heating and ventilation controls and a brand-new stereo system, too. Now, Vauxhall, like most manufacturers, are incorporating a satellite navigation system into the car, and you can have the option of a 5-inch television monitor screen right there, giving you the sat-nav. There's plenty of space for passengers and some handy storage bins too. It has to be said that the Amiga was always a decent car to drive. Rear wheel drive, a decent chassis and setup. And if you pick the 3 litre V6, well a real stormer of an engine. 211 brake horsepower on tap and very respectable 0 to 60 times of just over 8 seconds, top speed of 150 miles an hour. The 3 litre V6 of course continues into the new range in either Elite or MV6 form. This is the MV6 and this in my opinion is the pick of the bunch. It gets a lowered 
sport suspension by 15 millimeters, stiffer ride, a touch anyway, and unique alloy wheels and an aluminium dashboard. The base 2.0-litre engines don't really offer much get-up-and-go when pulling such a big car with only 136 brake horsepower. The 2.2-litre engine already seen in the Sintra produces 144 brake horsepower, and the 2.5 V6 gets 170. If you must have diesel, well, you can have the 2.5-litre inline 6 with 130 brake horsepower. But stand by, because next year a flagship Amiga will be available with an aluminium 300 brake horsepower V8 engine, the same as we've seen in the Corvette. Now, although Vauxhall make great play of competing with the main German manufacturers like Mercedes, BMW and Audi, in reality, the user chooser company car driver who has perhaps 25 to 30,000 pounds to spend on their next car, well, I'm afraid they're going to choose an E-Class or an A6 or a 5 Series over the Amiga, no matter how good this car is. The company car driver who doesn't have a choice, well, this is no bad car to have in their driveway. But perhaps the main rivals for the new Amiga are the Saab 95, the Volvo S80 or the new Rover 75. So the Amiga, not before time, has had a very welcome facelift, and that's really all that's happened with the car. The underpinnings remain the same as the outgoing Amiga model. It's very spacious, it's extremely well built. It's a car that can take on the might of Mercedes, BMW and Audi. It's just a shame it's got the wrong badge on it. MotorWeek News. Not content with knocking the Volkswagen Golf from top sales spot in 99, Vauxhall Opel are making the Astra lineup more competitive. The SXI does away with its 1.616 valve unit in favor of a 1.8 liter, yet the price stays the same. The entry level expression comes down in price by 500 pounds. A new DTI diesel engine has also been added, armed with 165 newton meters of torque at 1,800 revs, giving 58 miles per gallon at the pumps.